Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the early years of Dr. J.B. Rhine's research in parapsychology. My guest today is Barbara Ensrud, who is co-editor with Sally Rhine Feather of a wonderful anthology of J.B. Rhine's letters from 1923 to 1939, documenting the foundations of scientific parapsychology. Barbara has been a board member of the Rhine Research Center in Durham, North Carolina, and has served as president of the board of directors. She's based in the Durham, North Carolina area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Barbara. It's a real pleasure to have you with me today. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. I'm delighted to be here. I know that your work on the anthology of J.B. Rhine's letters took many years, and of course, we've covered the story a little bit earlier with your co-editor, Sally, who, who was J.B. Rhine's daughter and was participating in this research ever since she was a child. Um, but what I'd like to do today is to go into more details, because it seems to me that in the first 10 years of scientific parapsychology at Duke University, under the guidance of J.B. Rhine, much more was accomplished than simply establishing the existence of extrasensory perception. I think you're right. Uh, uh, he, he blazed a trail that had not been laid by anybody else, so he was a real pioneer in that respect. And it, it, um, the things that he discovered have broad ramifications, I think, both historically and, and certainly at the time, they received a lot of attention because of how groundbreaking they were. Yeah, I think many people today don't realize what a world-famous scientist J.B. Rhine had become. Yes, that's true. And the letters, I think, show that with the wide correspondence that he had uh, in this country, of course, with, with fellow scientists, but also abroad. I mean, certainly in England, where psychical research was very strong, um, starting in the late, um, the late 1800s, uh, and with, with the uh, Society for Psychical Research. Um, and also in Germany and, and in Netherlands, in the Netherlands and uh, in Italy, in Yugoslavia. I mean, there were many places that um, were doing parapsychology research and were interested in what Ryan was doing. His first monograph on extrasensory perception, I think it was just published uh, by originally by the Boston Society for Psychical Research attracted far more attention, I think, than even he had imagined. Yes, it did. Uh, he was pleasantly surprised by this, encouraged by it. I think that's what um, what really kept him going was was first his research that proved to himself that this was a viable field and something to explore. And then the responses that he got to the monograph, I think it also encouraged him to keep going and, and, and to continue. And the response, I think, w was mixed in a very funny way. The, the media seemed to climb all over it. The public interest was enormous and I think largely positive. But in the scientific community, particularly amongst psychologists who were the audience he was most interested in reaching, they were, to be honest, I, I think largely hostile. Well. Yes, it, it does come across that way, but I do think that it, it, it's typical of scientists to be skeptical. Um, and so Ryan was very um, 
respectful of skeptics. He was a skeptic himself. He acknowledged in some of the letters, you'll see him say that. And um, so he, he welcomed challenges to the research because he really felt that it would, it would help him hone it and make it better. Um, but what annoyed him uh, from some of the critics and the challenges that came forward were that people had not really read the research. So they were asking him, he had already answered many of their questions in his monograph and in other materials that he that he published. And, you know, he, he had the feeling that that, you know, they hadn't really read what he had done. I mean, I guess you could say there are two kinds of critics. There's a constructive critic who says, if you make this change in in your protocols, you'll have a better experiment. And that's the sort of criticism he welcomed. But there were other critics who were m more destructive. Uh, for example, Joseph Jastrow, who was a well-known psychologist, I think originally at the University of Wisconsin, uh, expressed an early interest in Ryan's research. Research, but later on, I found a letter in there where Ryan is is writing to him and really uh, criticizing him heavily because he said, "You you claim that you're suspicious of my research, but you won't tell me what your suspicions are. And when I try to find out from you, you put into print that you think I'm being evasive." <laughs> yes, he had a way of really getting right to the point, didn't he? Um, Jastrow was was a longtime critic of psychical research. And in fact, he was one of the first people that JB contacted when he wrote a letter saying, I want to go into this field. Can you give me some advice about how to do it? And Jastrow wrote back and said it discouraged him and said, you know, there's really no future in psychical research. Nothing can be proven. And you know, by scientists, you know, to please scientists. So I, I really think you should turn to another field, another aspect of the field. Um, I don't think he ever said psychology, but, you know, that would be the logical thing or philosophy. So, you know, he, he was a long time skeptic. And it, yes, I think that JB did, did, um, was disturbed by the fact that he wouldn't clarify what his criticisms were so that Ryan could address them. In, in fact, at one point, I noticed in, in a letter J.V. Ryan wrote to a, another more friendly colleague saying he's pretty sure that nothing will convince Jastro of the reality of extrasensory perception. There were many skeptics uh, who were downright hostile, in, in fact, um, but there were also psychical researchers in Europe who were very positive about the research, had an open mind to it and encouraged it. And even some of them replicated some of what, what JB had done, sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully. But it's interesting, you know, it was very important to Ryan to have an atmosphere for testing that was positive and conducive to this sort of delicate thing known as ESP. I remember, um, there. well, there's one letter that I'd like to, to mention. He wrote to Saltmarsh in, in England in 1938 about the importance of testing in the, in the right atmosphere. One only needs to remember that he is studying not a physical substance, but a human being and probably the most delicate and uncertain feature of the human being. He understood the elusiveness of this, the fact that you, you, you not only have to be open to the existence of ESP, um, but you have to approach it in an almost offhand way as sort of a challenge to your, you know, thinking you can do it. I mean, this was very, this was a very important aspect of his testing conditions. And he explained that in many of the letters to a lot of the people that he wrote to. I know he, he wrote that the conditions need to be playful and that if people are 
concentrating and trying uh, too hard, he said that interferes. Their scores will typically drop if they try too hard. Very often with the scientific method, um, the sort of uh, gravitas with which it, it is approached by some scientists, very serious and, and a sort of a severe laboratory setting, uh, can be off-putting to people. And it, it's why experiments were done um, somewhat later, you may be aware of these, but um, about the experimenter effect and how some people could be successful because of the way that they approached uh, the subject and the situation and others who were very um, sort of aloof and, and um, not expectant of good outcomes. And in fact, that's, <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> so that, that's something that's being discussed today, as a matter of fact, in scientific circles. Today, we can look back and we have a database of, I b believe now, well over 1,400 different experiments in parapsychology that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, uh, but in, with many, many nuances of personality traits, altered states of consciousness, experimenter effect, expectancy effects, belief systems and the like. But in, in the early days, though, Ryan himself established several important principles uh, that are still valid. Uh, one of them, for example, is, has to do with the relationship of distance between the subject and the target. Well, the distance telepathy experiments were very important and a great surprise at first that uh, they established that distance had no effect on ESP. The first one was done some 250 feet, I think, away in a different building on Duke campus. And then he extended that. He worked with people um, in Western North Carolina, for example, and then ultimately in, in California. And eventually there was even work with, with someone in um, people in Italy and in Yugoslavia, where they did long distance ESP very carefully set up with timing and everything. And, you know, it was very successful. It showed that time, that distance has no effect. In, in fact, as I recall, uh, some of his early studies in distance produced some of the very strongest uh, effects. I, I know you quote one letter in which uh, the subject was scoring 15, 16, 17 hits out of a deck of 25 when you would only expect five hits by chance. Yes, yes. He, he talks about that. Um, these results total 51 hits out of 75. He was writing to Dr. Prince at the Boston Society, um, giving a deviation of 36 above chance, which is 22 times the probable error, significant beyond one's wildest dreams, he wrote. So he, he, was, he was delighted to discover this. And of course, the next step was, was um, time. What effect does time have? on telepathy and clairvoyance and ESP in general. And those experiments showed that um, that's when the first experiments and research with precognition was taking place. And that too was, was another uh, an absolutely astonishing. <laughs> he writes in 1936, after he'd done quite a lot of the precog um, research, he wrote, he wrote to one of his donors, mild and innocuous ESP aroused so much interest. What will follow when the more universe splitting precognition results come out? It seems to me the highest peak of all and what results we have here are most encouraging. So that was in 1936. You know, his reputation was getting around quite a, quite a lot then. So that by 1937, when he did his first popular book, New Frontiers of the Mind, um, it, you know, it turned out to be a bestseller, was a book of the month club selection. 
and gained a wide popular audience. And that's when they began to receive so many cases of people who experienced ESP in one way or another. JB's wife, Lawaza, you know, was receiving and taking and, and sort of beginning to catalog those responses and um, those cases that we, we still have all of those on file, hers, as well as more recent ones that come in through our website, Brian.org. I think it's very ironic that on the one hand, you have hundreds, probably thousands of people writing in and saying, thank you for this research. It confirms my own experience. And they give detailed examples of numerous experiences that Louisa was cataloging. And at the same time, you have the establishment in psychology saying, none of this is real at all. It can't possibly be happening. Well, well, isn't isn't that the way of all scientific breakthroughs? I mean, throughout history, I mean, actually, in some of the letters, Ryan, you know, cites um, all the people who who preceded him who had problems. I mean, Pasteur and Copernicus, Galileo, and and just you know, Lister, so many who pioneering and 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 doing breakthroughs that were just completely dismissed by the scientific community of the day. Well, that would be uh, the case with Ryan. And of course, here we are today, uh, 90, almost a whole century later, and the uh, strength of the opposition hasn't really weakened, even though the strength of the evidence just keeps getting stronger and stronger. I think physics and quantum physics is is sort of um, beginning to change some people's minds because it it um, it confirms and affirms some of the findings that Ryan had back in that decade of the 1930s. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, and uh, of course, we've done many interviews on that topic alone. The relationship between physics and parapsychology is is fascinating. And and speaking of physics, I suppose we we really need to talk about Ryan's. I, I would call it his third great discovery after extrasensory perception and precognition is psychokinesis. Yes, yes, that that also got him very excited in the, in the mid 30s when they started um it, that came about when a gambler stopped by the lab. He had written to Ryan and said that he was capable of influencing dice um at casinos. And so he stopped by the lab and and demonstrated his ability and so Ryan started working um, with fellow technicians, um, himself, Louisa, friends, students, of course, and they were astonished at what they were able to find about psychokinesis. And the reason that resonates so much today is because this, this effect of, of mind over matter um, is very important in, in healing. And we know how much healing is an important topic today. It's very, it, it's becoming more so all the time. And it, um, it also is, is, is uh, has this long distance aspect to it, which, which is, which is very interesting in, in light of his, his distance work with telepathy and clairvoyance, because so much healing now is done via long distance either, you know, through the phone or through people making appointments at specific times. Edgar Casey did this, as a matter of fact. To my understanding, Barbara, the parapsychology community overall wasn't that open to healing, even though the research in psychokinesis was well established. I, I, at least, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that until Bernard Grad did his healing studies in the 1960s, uh, many parapsychologists really just ignored that whole area. Yes, I think. That is correct. Um, for for some reason, 
Well, I, you know, times are different now. And so we're so much more open to alternative medicine, so-called. Um, and, and, you know, well, I mean, you know, there's just a large contingent around the globe that is more open-minded to all of these things. And to, and and science is has not really caught up yet, but I think it is catching up because I think that there are... Um, I just finished reading Dr. Bruce Grayson's book, After, which is, I recommend to everyone, because it it, it has, it, you know, it not only talks about near-death ex- experiences, but the ramifications of them and, and, you know, how it changes people's lives, really transforms them. So I think that, that in the 1930s, Ryan, they weren't, they weren't that far along yet in that respect. But the mere fact of psychokinesis, which he continued to research throughout the 30s, but did not publish until the 40s. He didn't f- publish his psychokinesis work, even though he writes about it uh, quite a lot. And we have a number of letters where he really um, talks about the thousands of tests that they did and, and th- the amazing results that they got. I'm aware of one fascinating letter in which uh, a, a correspondent wrote to Rhine, and uh, I'm pretty sure the uh, correspondent was suggesting that there's a relationship between extrasensory perception and homosexuality. And Rhine responded by saying it sounds like a very viable area to look into. However, he said, when you're already doing work that's on the fringes, he said, the best advice is to be as conservative as you can in every other area beside that area. So he said he wouldn't he wouldn't dare explore the question of homosexuality uh, and ESP. It was far too controversial and it would just get him into more trouble. Yes, yes. I remember that letter, too. And um, um yeah, he doesn't really, that's that's really his only, the only expression that we know of about that. But it was a good response, and that's the reason we wanted to include it in the book. Because we thought, you know, it sort of, it speaks to today and, and what is going on um, uh, in terms of gender. Not just gender, but there are many, many other areas today uh, that overlap with parapsychology. Uh, For example, UFO research. And I know that, or many other areas of the so-called paranormal, Bigfoot research and, 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 and so on, where you might say there's a legitimate overlap, but researchers in these different fields all feel still so marginalized and so threatened with their main area of specialty that they rarely venture out into doing research that might combine different areas that are all controversial into one study. Well, yes, this sort of of cross-fertilization of fields, um, you know, we've certainly seen it in the medical community. I mean, where, you know, this is something I think that appeals to people with alternative medicine is that it addresses the whole body, the whole system and the mind. And and yes, so unfortunately, it's, Things are too compartmentalized, and I, I think the future is is I really do think the future will will bring to get bring things together more. At least that's my hope. I think that the attention that's that's being paid in in various quarters um, tell me that that's what's going to happen. Well, I, and I see it happening. Of course, I'm in a unique position being involved in uh, uh, an internet YouTube channel where I'm not constrained by the guardians of uh, academia or the, the guardians of uh, the scientific bureaucracies and, and so on. So I'm free to bring together the, the many people who and serious scholars who are interested in combining these areas. However, I, I, I can say, Barbara, that 
Not long ago, I interviewed a prominent British parapsychologist, and I'm, I'm sure you know that in the United Kingdom, parapsychology has made real inroads into perhaps a dozen different universities there. So it, it's, a, from my point of view, a wonderful thing. But I brought up the question of UFOs and uh, parapsychology and how one prominent parapsychologist, Robert Morris, who went over and helped establish uh, all, all of the important work going on in the United Kingdom. Bob Morris actually dropped out of my doctoral research committee at Berkeley because he objected to the fact that I was investigating the case of Ted Owens, a man who had worked under J.B. Ryan at one time, but who claimed that he was also a UFO contactee. And uh, Morris said, you just can't combine these. And so just a few months ago, I asked Chris Rowe, a prominent British parapsychologist, about that. And he said, yes, I agree with Bob Morris. We, we shouldn't be combining these. We, we still have enough trouble establishing parapsychology as a legitimate field. We don't want to mix it with something else equally controversial. I, one can sympathize with that view simply because people are trying to make their way. And, and um, but yes, it does seem to me, science has must be open minded. Um, I mean, that to me is what science is open to questioning things. So to examine these things seriously, the way that, I mean, this is what J.B. did in, in his pioneering research, is he was trying to look at it in a way that it hadn't been looked at before, and um, to approach it, 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 it but with, in a scientific way, with controls and with, you know, with, with proper documentation, and um, so I, I, I'm sorry to hear that, but um, I guess I understand it because I, I see in the letters, JB's letters, how frustrated he felt um, at the non-acceptance and, and the and the difficulty of of um, of wanting to be um, to have his research accepted in the field, but not only accepted, um, he wanted people to replicate his research. He wanted people to continue it and expand it. I mean, he says at one point, I think this was in his, in his last days, that, he, that, you know, the work will go on. And I think it's expressed in one of his, that no matter what happens to me, the work will go on. And it has, even though it is still somewhat marginalized. As I recall, he was rather critical of the field studies approach that was it was the dominant approach in the field of psychical research, particularly in England? Yes, but are we are we not hearing um, a lot today um, in scientific circles, and not only about parapsychology, but but about the anecdotal and the sir effect, and how we need to pay more attention to it? I think this is referred to as, as qualitative over quantitative research. And there is, there is a, a, a letter that speaks to that. Um, he, was in, he was in touch with um, Professor Katzoff at the University of North Carolina, uh, who actually criticized him a little bit. He said, I think you, you overdo it on the, on the quantitative research. You're not paying enough attention to qualitative. And so it's almost like what goes around comes around. I mean, this is this seems to be quite prominent now in um, in scientific circles, not just parapsychology. The issues uh, between quantitative and qualitative research uh, still provoke very lively debates throughout uh, all of psychology, and in fact, even sociology and uh, the l larger uh, ec economics, uh, behavioral sciences in general. As if we're making incremental progress, shall we say. Yeah. Too, too incremental in, in some respects, but... Nevertheless, well, we're in an era today where people are questioning large bodies of research that were well established in psychology, which 
I think the psychologists felt themselves to be threatened, which is why they seem so off-putting to uh, the work in extrasensory perception. Yes, and, and there was a um, a conference this weekend. It was held yesterday, I think, by the Parapsychological Association. Um, that was addressed. I didn't get to attend because I had other things that I, I had to be involved with. But um, I just, the topics that they covered, I think, were addressing some of these, including um, the gentleman that you mentioned, Chris Rowe, was part of that. Jim Carpenter and his work on first sight. Um, of course, Jim Carpenter worked with Ryan uh, at Duke. Um, in fact, came to Duke uh, because he was encouraged by Ryan to do so. So, and he's doing important theoretical work. His his theory of, uh, first, I think he calls it first sight. Yes, yes. It, it is important the, the work, and 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 he also is a psychotherapist, and I think that he, you know, is is um, probably very forward looking in that respect as well. Well, your anthology of Rhine's letters ends in 1939, just as the uh, classic book ESP After 60 Years was going to press. For, for publication. They had completed the preparation of that book. And even today, 80 years later, I think of uh, ESP after 60 years as one of the most significant books ever published in parapsychology. I think so, too. It really tried to address every aspect of the criticism that had been directed at since 1930, well, 30, 36 really is when a lot of it started, 37 especially, and 38. So yes, they um, that book is very important, and it's, it's beginning to be looked at again by scientists. So, uh, and they're discovering, I know one contacted Sally, um, mentioning that, you know, we thought we were breaking new ground with remote viewing, but in fact, this is something that your father was already doing back in the 1930s. And it's true because um, some, some of the precognitive work and, and the, um, the psychokinesis work, uh, really, you could say that, that you know, this was um, sort of the early versions of, of remote viewing. Ryan is typically identified these days with a very strict form of experimental psychology involving statistics and uh, card guessing, which many people think of as incredibly dull and boring, the, just exactly the kind of an experiment that might turn people off to uh, performing well in extrasensory perception. But Actually, he got into the field because he was interested in survival. And even though he was disenchanted with the early research he saw with different mediums, he never lost his interest in survival, as far as I can tell. He, he, he even writes very movingly about being with his mentor, William McDougall, at, around the time of McDougall's death and how the idea of an afterlife was very important to both of them. Yes, it was important to both of them. And I think his frustration was that he was just finding it impossible to prove scientifically. All he could do was show that the mind was capable of, of capacities, abilities that were sort of beyond the physical brain. And of course, I think that this, the current research along those lines, uh, separating the brain and the mind, I mean, I think that's, very, that's a very um, hot topic today in in scientific uh, areas, especially neurosurgery and neuroscience. Um, but yes, I, I think that um, he just felt that he he understood. He expresses in some of the letters that he realizes that you know doing thousands of tests with guessing cards 
it, you know, is sort of dull and pedestrian. But he said, we have to we have to do it. We and we have to keep doing it. And this was, of course, in the period that that we're we're talking about here, this decade. Uh, they did branch out, you know, in other ways to try and do other things in later decades, uh, certainly up, you know, well, even to what the Rhine is doing today. But um, he he just felt that he he couldn't figure out a scientific way to approach contact with the beyond. And I, I think that it was, um, it was the foundation for his original research because that's what he wanted. He said that's, I mean, he recognized that that's the ultimate question that we all have. And certainly we, we still have it. Obviously there are books and books and books about it. And certainly the NDE research, you know, has, has a lot to do with it. And Ian Stevenson's work um, with children in India. I mean, all of this, all of this is forcing this field to reach out and also embrace a much wider uh, reach, shall we say. One of his books was entitled "The Reach of the Mind," and I, I feel like he never really felt that he that he had plumbed that that you know that it was just it would go on and on and and. Um, you know, he would be intrigued by some of what is going on today, I think. Also, I think it's fair to say he anticipated a number of future developments. I see even back in the 1930s, uh, long before the development of uh, computers, he was interested in, in finding machines that he could use for testing. ESP with, so they wouldn't have to rely on the potential of uh, human error getting involved. Yes, he, he certainly worked with um, with with scientists who uh, who developed some of these machines. Like uh, I think Helmut Schmidt is is one example. But he he had great respect and interest in engineering and worked with engineers. There's, I was reading, just looking over some of the letters again, I was reading a long letter he wrote to um, Mr. Buck, who was at General Electric, and worked with a group of his colleagues there on, on ESP research. And, and he, he was, um, he had, he worked, there was another engineer out in um, Michigan, I believe in Grand Rapids, um, and a few other places in, in New York, I think, also. Um, he was very interested in engineering. And if you think about it, uh, um, if, you, if you look at Edison and um, Ford with the automobile and everything, they were engineers and they were, you know, pioneering in new ways. And, and he, um, he, he respected that. He, he liked working with engineers. He felt that they were very creative. I'm going to circle back around again to ESP after 60 years. It's such a classic book, and I think it needs to be laid out clearly that Rhine went out of his way to find every single published criticism about his research and to respond to it. And that's what that book contains, a detailed response to each and every criticism that had been raised at that point in 1939 to the extrasensory perception research. And the responses are really quite thorough and articulate. Yes, they are. And, and his whole team worked on that. Um, Gaither Pratt and, and Charles Stewart and uh, a couple of other people um, who are acknowledged. I mean, you can see they, they sort of co-authored with him. But um, I think I think that book is is, um, you know, he contacted every critic and invited them to submit a paper about, you know, he told them what he was doing with ESP after 60 years and and um, invited them to contribute to the book. And only two of them did. Um, Robert Thales, who was actually very supportive of Ryan's work and uh, certainly open to it and, and tried many things on his own. Um, and then I think the other one was Willoughby, who was a... Um, very strongly skeptical, and um, and he 
he, I think he submitted something that is one, in one of the appendices of the book, uh, reiterating his criticisms of the work, which Ryan felt that, that they had answered every criticism that he had. And, um, but it, it, it surprised him that more of his critics didn't um, accept that invitation to, to contribute to the book. He seemed to understand that the criticisms weren't necessarily predicated upon uh, scientific methodology. A lot of people criticized the research because as far as they were concerned, it didn't matter how good the research was, the findings were impossible. Therefore, they couldn't be real in any case. Yes, it's amazing that we still hear um, views like that being expressed in this day and age when we know so much more about what we don't know that it, 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 you would think that, that, that scientists in particular would be open to investigating everything that might pertain to what makes us tick, how our minds work, what consciousness is. And um, I think it's what makes the field so exciting because so much more of this research is going on. Well, it certainly is. If J.B. Ryan were alive today, I think he would be happy to see that the field is progressing. Well, Barbara, I want to thank you so much for being with me and for sharing this very significant history with me and with the New Thinking Aloud audience. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's been a pleasure to be with you and talk with you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.